Unlike many people, I don't use Google Chrome, but I do use Safari on the Mac, and today I'm going to help you get the most from it. Welcome back to Marcellus Reviews and thank you for subscribing if you have, and if you haven't subscribed, the button is just down there. Now, according to stats, Google Chrome has something like 64% of the global browser market share. So if, like me, you use Apple's Safari to browse the web, you're in the minority. But Safari isn't without its quirks, and due to a few recent updates, it isn't the easiest browser to get your head around. Worse still, there's lots of features that you might not even be aware exist, and they're features that can make your life easier, make you do things quicker. It's stuff that is really worth knowing. So today I'm going to help you get the most from Safari and reveal my favorite Safari tips. I'll just open the beast of the 16 inch MacBook Pro review of this coming very soon, I promise. Now we're going to start with something which I completely misunderstood at WWDC this year, and that is tab groups. When I first heard about this new feature, I thought it was a way to create collections of tab groups that you'd go back to regularly. I even started setting up tab groups for common tasks. So for example, for my blogging, for the website and for my Medium account, I have a set of websites that I use each morning. So I set up a tab group called blogging, and in that I had Medium, I had my website, I had a title capitalization tool. That was a complete waste of time because I realized that as soon as you started opening those tab groups and then closed certain tabs within them, or perhaps opened a new website while you're in that tab group, the tab group itself just lost all meaning and all the original tabs that were there were either gone or joined by completely unrelated websites. Now that's completely down to the fact that I totally misunderstood what tab groups are for. The reason they exist is to give you an option to save a tab group state to come back to later. Now the most obvious example of this is if you're doing some research for a holiday, for instance. So you've perhaps got an airline website open, maybe a hotel comparison website, a review website, and you start doing your research and then you have to go make the dinner or you have to go out, you have to go to work. Something happens that takes you away from all those websites. Now, how many times in the past have you done that and then just closed Safari, come back to it later and thought, oh, I wish I'd kept that stuff open. That is where tab groups are your knight in shining armor. If I take another example, if I'm doing some research for a blog that I'm writing, for example, I might have, as I've got here, four tabs open. So I've got a tab open on AirPods Max, another piece from The Verge, my Medium stories to refer to, and then for whatever reason, I'm perhaps referring to some Apple events as well to, to write this blog. Now, if I get called away to do something else, it would be nice just to save this tab group so I can come back to it later on. It's really easy to do this. So Apple gives us a little option at the top left of the screen. So when you've got all your tabs open and you wanna save this state of tabs, if you click the little drop down arrow here, we can choose new tab group with four tabs. And if I click that, that will basically create a new tab group which contains these tabs that we currently have open and I can call it what I like. So let's call it AirPods. Mac, Oops, spell it properly, that would help, wouldn't it? AirPods Max blog research. Done, simple as that. So for instance, if I come back later on and for whatever reason, I've reopened Safari, I've gone to a different Mac, for example, and I have a blank page here, but I wanna go back to that AirPods Max research that I was doing, I can simply click at the top, choose my AirPods Max blog research tab group, and bang, all of those tabs I had open previously are back. And something I wasn't aware about until recently is the fact that you can create a brand new tab group from a folder of bookmarks. So for instance, if I want to open all of the websites in the Marketless Reviews folder as tabs, I can right click on that folder, go to open in tab group, click new tab group, and there we go. <laughs> That's a lot of websites, but it's opened all of those websites. It's given me the option to create a brand new tab group. It's taken the name from the folder of the bookmarks, but I can change it if I need to. And there you go, a very quick way to create a brand new tab group from any of your bookmark folders. And the best thing about tab groups is that they are synced across all of your Apple devices. So that same AirPods Max blog research tab group is available on my iPhone, on my iPad, on my Mac mini. Basically, I can go back to those tab groups on any device. It's absolutely brilliant. Sticking with the tabs theme, there's another really useful tool Apple has built into Safari, which enables you to pin your most used websites. Now, I don't do this with loads of websites. I only use it for one or two that I use quite regularly. One of them being, for instance, Notion. And I use Notion to manage this brand and to manage all of my blogs and my videos and stuff. So it's nice to have it there all the time and very instantly accessible. And the way you pin tabs is really straightforward. So once you've got your website open that you want to pin, you can basically right click on the address bar, 
click on pin tab and it plunks it just over here. And you can pin as many tabs to this as you want to as well. So for instance, if I wanna add my website to that, I can right click on that as well, click on pin tab, and there we go. Adds it to the pinned tabs on the left-hand side. And switching between them, as you would expect, you just click the little icon, the little favicon, and that will take you to that website in question. Really straightforward. The only thing I'd say about pin tabs is that I don't really know what Apple does in the background. So if you, let's say you've pinned 15 tabs, for instance, which would be a lot, but let's just say you have. If one or two of those are quite resource intensive, I don't know if Apple stops them loading in the background or if it continues to load those websites in the background. If it does the latter, that could potentially have a bit of an impact on your battery life and potentially the performance of your Mac. So I would be careful with how many pinned tabs you have. So we've already established that having multiple tabs open is very useful for productivity and it's a very common way that people use browsers. But switching between tabs can be a bit of a pain sometimes. And if you need to refer to two websites, it's nice to have them side by side. Now you can actually do that quite easily. So for instance, if I've got two websites open here, Medium and the BBC's website, and I wanna keep them both on the screen at the same time without clicking between tabs, what you can do is drag either one of these websites out of the tab bar, that basically opens that website in a completely new Safari window. And the benefit of that is that we have the other website as a window behind it, which means we can put them both into split screen. And doing this is really straightforward. You basically long press on the little green button at the top left of the screen, choose tile window to left or right. Once you've done that, we can then choose the other Safari window and bang, we've got both websites side by side. It's so much easier than flicking between tabs. Again, I use this all of the time. Have you heard of Read of View in Safari? This is something that has been gradually hidden more and more by Apple. I don't know why, because it's such a useful feature and it's been around for ages. I can't remember when they introduced it, but it was quite a while ago. And the whole point of the Reader feature is to basically strip away all of the crap that you get on some websites, all the adverts and all the stuff, all the content that has nothing to do with what you want to read and just give you the text and the images related to that blog or article. So for instance, if I'm reading this Samsung Galaxy Book Pro review, I might just want to strip back all of the stuff that is distracting me and just read the text and see the images. To do that, very straightforward. Top of the screen, you've got these little three dots. Click on there, click read a view, and that does exactly what I've just described. So it strips back all of the adverts, all the things that you don't want to see, and it gives you this very easy to read, attractive presentation of the article itself. It retains all of the images, all the links and stuff, but it just gives you the content you want to engage with. And again, I use this all the time. Now, annoyingly, Reader View doesn't work with every single website. There are certain websites for whatever reason, down to the way they've been built, just don't seem to be compatible with it, which is a bit of a pain. But most blogs, most news-based websites do work with the reader view. So it's just a great way to get rid of all that stuff on the screen that you don't need to see. And it's very useful, again, if you're doing research, for example, and you just want to hone in on the words, give it a go. Reader view is such a good way of giving you a much more pleasurable web experience. Password management is a big part of using the web. It's a very important part of using the web. You do not want to get this wrong. I've moved over to 1Password completely now, and it's one of the best things I've done for my Mac and for basically any device I use. That's partly because I do flip between macOS and Windows occasionally, so it's nice to have something that is cross-platform. But there are two options with, well, there's several options with this. There's the third-party options like 1Password, and the other one is to use Apple's Keychain. Now, I used Keychain for many years, Nothing wrong with it at all. Works brilliantly, as you would expect, across Apple devices. It suggests passwords that are very secure when you're signing up to new services. And it obviously retains all of your previous login details that can very easily be retrieved when you log into a website or service. Something that you may not know is that you can quite easily get back to your saved passwords in Safari Keychain. The way that you do that is that you go into Safari, Preferences, and then into passwords. Now, I won't show you mine here, obviously, but depending on what device you're using, you can then use Touch ID or Face ID, and it will give you all of your passwords that you've saved, all the usernames, you can copy and paste them, you can change them if you need to. Now, I do admit that it's not quite as convenient as 1Password when it comes to that, because 1Password has this menu bar item up here. And if I go into there, type in my master password, it takes me into my master password list. Now again, I'm not gonna show you what I've got in here, but I can very easily, no matter where I am in macOS, retrieve 
any password, any login details, and in fact, anything I have stored in 1Password, because 1Password does go beyond password management. You can put pretty much anything you like in there. So 1Password is a bit easier to use when it comes to retrieving passwords compared to Keychain, but obviously it comes at a cost, and if you'd rather keep costs to a minimum and you've spent a lot of money on a new MacBook, for example, then Keychain is just fantastic. If you're not using Keychain, turn it on now. One of the best things about being stuck in the Apple ecosystem is that the way in which these devices talk to one another is genuinely useful and can really help with productivity. And one of the best things about Safari is something called handoff. So for instance, if I'm doing some research on my iPhone about mics to buy for the studio, I've perhaps done a little Google search for the mic that I'm looking for, and I suddenly realize that I wanna do the rest of the research on my Mac because the screen's a bit small on here. I just need a bit more space to do things on. Now there's two ways of moving this website from here onto here. The first one is to press the little share button at the bottom and choose my MacBook Pro. And in doing that, magically, any second now, it appears on my MacBook, like that. Sometimes it takes a bit longer than usual, I'm not sure why. The other way of doing it, have the website open on your iPhone and then look out on your Mac for a little icon that pops up here, which says Safari from iPhone. Click on that and the exact same thing. It takes me to that exact same web page that was open on my iPhone. It's a little thing, but it's something I use very regularly and it's just a great way that all this stuff interacts. Now, I hope that you found at least one of those tips and tricks for Safari useful, but I'm curious, have you got your own? Is there something that I haven't mentioned today that you do with Safari that you think would benefit other people? If so, let us know in the comments. Now, if you've still got some time and you'd like to see how I make the most of Apple Notes, keep watching for a link to that video at the end of this one. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you next time.